What's up, family? Thank you so much for tuning in for today's episode of the Recovered on Purpose show. The Recovered on Purpose show is sponsored by all the students who signed up to add purpose, meaning, and joy to their lives in recovery with the Recovery Speaker Share Your Story Powerfully course. Today's student shout-out goes to Krista Barnes. Krista has been dedicated to changing her life through personal development and is preparing her incredibly powerful story with a message to serve survivors of sex trafficking and to help teens and parents of teens avoid falling victim to these horrible crimes. I'm super proud of you, Krista, and I can't wait to help get this story out. If you have a story of addiction and recovery you want to learn how to make impact and income with, Follow the link in the pinned comment to book your one-time, 100% free call with me so we can strategize exactly how you can do it. Enjoy the show and keep living Recovered on Purpose. The black represents the darkness from which we came. The white represents the light in which we now live. And the red represents the passion it takes to live Recovered on Purpose. Hello, 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 and welcome everybody to the Recovered on Purpose show. I'm so excited that you're here. And guys, we are about to get into an incredible, incredible conversation that I am so stoked on. We actually talked about a week ago, and over the last week, I've been implementing some of the things from our call, and guys, we have some things to share with you. So Ryan uh, is a PhD, husband, father, speaker, author, professor, founder of Dr. Ryan Montague, PhD in Communication, University of Missouri, is the founder of Divine Opportunity Ministries. Before starting the ministry, Ryan spent over a decade as a professor of communication management in higher education, specializing in emotional intelligence in personal and professional relationships. Ryan is the author of two books, Divine Opportunity, Finding God in the Conversations of Everyday Life, and Untapped Potential, Moving from Mediocre to a Miraculous Testimony. As for the ministry, Ryan specializes in teaching three content areas, kingdom coupling, how to attract, date, and select a godly spouse, kingdom mindset, how to be set free and stay free despite fierce pressure from the outside world, and kingdom moments, how to demonstrate God's love and presence in everyday life. Ryan has been married to his wife, Deborah, since January 3rd, 2009. Deborah and Ryan have three kids, David, McKenna, and Bella. They live in greater Los Angeles. Guys, I am so excited to introduce you to my good friend, Ryan. Ryan, great to see you, brother, and thank you for being here. Yeah, good to see you. Glad I could join you on this. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, man, and I'm I'm so stoked on having this conversation because in, in my life from, you know, from the time I gave my life to Christ at 10 years old, I started having these types of things. You know, a lot of people say that they aren't like, you know, maybe they're just a personal thing. Maybe, you know, they don't happen for everybody, you know, but it sounds like you actually might have a solution for the listeners to learn exactly how to grasp onto and experience these divine opportunities. Am I right? Yeah, you're exactly right. And, you know, what you just described is exactly what I went through that process of hearing other people's kind of amazing God stories and thinking, you know, it was for the pastors or the missionaries or these kinds of anointed folks only to do kind of a deep dive into the, to the study of the topic and, and realize that, uh, and really the quote that sums it all up for me was from this philosopher, Martin Buber, who said, it's not about gifted or ungifted. It's simply about those who give themselves versus those who withhold themselves. Mm. And so it became that oh, process good. of, well, how do I get out of my own way and get out of my head and stop withholding myself? and actually start giving over to some of those moments, taking some risks and just seeing what God does and just trust the process that eventually these divine opportunities and these stories will start coming my way. And that's exactly what ended up happening over the course of several years. Amen. Amen. And just so the listeners know, I mean, we we connected uh, to do this show to talk about these God opportunities. And obviously this show is is specifically for addicts and addicts in recovery. But yeah. one thing that we all have in common is that we need that, that connection with a higher power in order to stay recovered. And the number one relapse prevention is purpose and living in the, in the will of God. So this is going to be something that will actually teach people how to, you know, recognize the will of God and how to follow it. So when did you start to recognize that in your own life? And tell us a little bit about that story of how you got to this point. Yeah, gosh, I mean, there's 
uh, so much that's kind of happened over the years. But a lot of that was, you know, kind of growing up in the growing up in the faith. But as many youth do, you're just kind of going through the most motions. You're showing up to church on Sunday and and just really kind of disconnected from it in, in a large way. And so my journey really included having kind of gone through that kind of an experience, being super lukewarm about the faith, really pretty clueless overall. And then when I moved out to Hollywood, California, like a year after I graduated from college was when my roommate actually invited me to a church. And it was kind of a church that really opened up a whole new side of the faith for me. I think I hit a point in my life where I was open to kind of more be eager to to receive and hear and, and step into that relationship with God. And then that really kind of started this, this ongoing journey of experiencing more and more of God and also just running in circles where people that were around me were experiencing God at, at a deeper level and were kind of paving the way and setting an example to, to go to, a, to a, a more heartfelt, intentional place with that. Yeah. And so to make a long story short, originally I moved out to Hollywood for entertainment purposes and was doing a little bit of entertainment stuff was doing some background acting in TV shows and films, uh, became an audience coordinator for their live TV show recordings and was kind of bouncing around all sorts of different things, trying to f- just figure life out and, and find a, a plan to, to be able to dedicate more time and effort into long haul. Ended up, you know, getting certified to be a personal trainer. Uh, I think certified to be a substitute teacher, you name it, was just kind of going through the list. Eventually became a real estate assistant for a couple of years. And, and found my way into uh, going back into grad school and, and being feeling called to be a professor. Kind of a crazy story is that uh, even just a divine opportunity that happened with that is that when I was in college, I was doing some stand-up comedy, was around some comedians. And this one comedian had recommended this book called The Artist's Way. And I had read the book. Have you, yeah. Are you familiar with it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. So got a hold of that, read it before I moved to, to Hollywood. And then when I was working as a real estate assistant, one of the properties, commercial properties, I would kind of get sent over to pick up trash, paint over graffiti, stuff like that. And I'm in this parking lot and all this trash, it's a windy day. The trash is just swirling around and I'm grabbing what I can. And then out of nowhere, this flyer is whirling around in the wind and it sticks and lands on my up against my leg. And so I grab it and I look at it and it was a flyer for the Artist Way Workshop. It was being held in LA. I mean, and come on. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> so, so I sign up for it. I end up going through like three different courses with this lady and meeting some really cool friends along the, the way in that cohort. And that's actually in that course was when I decided and felt called to be a college professor and go back for my master's degree at Cal State Northridge. Then went on to do a PhD at the University of Missouri which is where I actually had the opportunity to study the topic of divine opportunities. And so for the, for the dissertation, which is kind of your big final research project and, and uh, paper for the, for the PhD, I actually got the opportunity to research divine appointment conversations and missed opportunities. So wow. for that research, I interviewed a little over 30 people about a divine appointment experience that they had had and a missed opportunity. And then that really kind of blew things wide open in terms of just having such a deeper admiration, excitement, hunger, thirst for the topic, still not having any really kind of major noteworthy kind of conversations and divine opportunities of my own. But it, it really kind of that idea of like taste and see that the Lord is good and, and you just have this hunger and thirst for it. And that's where I really dedicated, like I'm going after this thing and, and started putting my own research and learnings into practice. And eventually now I've got dozens and dozens and dozens of stories that we could go on all day about, but that's kind of a little bit of the progression that led up to that. Amen. And you've said two things that I wanted to bring up. Um, One of them, you were talking about, you know, being around people and like, they'll start seeing things or you'll start seeing things in their life, right. That, you know, God is showing up in their life. And something that I always say is like, it's, it's hard to hang out with me and not believe in God. Because when I'm like, when I'm, when I'm in it with him and I'm like following what he wants me to do and stuff, like if you're hanging, if you're spending time with me, you're going to see these divine opportunities happen. You're going to hear about me talking about them all the time. Right. And I've, I've noticed that I actually had a conversation with someone last night and we were going pretty deep and he's like this, uh, 
like super cyber security uh, entrepreneur who works for big places in San Francisco and stuff, but he's an atheist. So mm -hmm. the conversation got to a point where it was just like, you know, he didn't even want to go there with me. Right. He didn't want to keep yeah. going with the, with the talk about God because uh, he didn't, he didn't know how this is happening for me. Right. We're going to get into that conversation. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, one question, what do you think would have happened if when that flyer hit your leg, if you would have just brushed it off as if it wasn't a thing? Mm. Gosh, a great question. I hadn't really thought about that before, but you know, I think that God kind of drops in those little, little nudges, promptings, uh, and connections where, you know, that's the thing about free will is mm -hmm. that you have the, the choice to respond to those and to notice them and, and call them what they are yeah. and pray into it. You know, Lord, is this you? Yeah. And, but there is that that's, and that's the thing with all divine opportunities is that there's a moment of free will where you can choose to again, give or withhold. And so I think had I skipped over that, you know, it probably would have just delayed and stretched out the, the wandering a bit longer is yeah. I think, you know, God would have got a hold of me and, and maybe I'd still end up in, in a similar place to where I am. But I think we take a lot of unnecessary detours and waste a lot of our own time by being disobedient and writing some of those things off. And it's, uh, you know, I, the image that came to mind for me for a while back was that this past spring, we took our kids to Disneyland. And so we got these like three day passes. And so we, we hardly ever go. I mean, once every five, you know, more than that, we've, we've been out here for 10 years. We've only been twice. And so uh, when we went, we were like, okay, we want to make the most of this. So we bought these lightning lane passes that allow you to skip the, skip yep. the winding line and go boom, straight to the front. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's where a lot of people have the choice. Obedience is getting the lightning lane. Mm. And when you're obedient to God's promptings and, the, and you're picking up on them and you have eyes to see the unseen, ears to hear the unheard, and you're walking in those, it's like having the lightning lightning pass. And, and God yeah. can take you so much further, so much faster because of that obedience. But when you're disobedient and you continually miss those or you recognize them, but choose another, choose another way and try to maybe choose your own way instead of God's, it's like get, you got to sit in that winding line until you're finally ready to get out and, and get into that lightning lane with the Lord. I love that. I love that. And that's in Proverbs. That's one of my favorite ones in Proverbs. It says the lovers of God will have a life that is a highway. You know, mm. <laughs> I love so it. Good. I love it. I'm going to hop in the comments and we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to crack a joke at the end of the live stream because we've been called out to crack a joke. So we're, we're both going to have to come with some with some dad jokes. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll, I'll figure one out, too. <laughs> Glenn, good to see you, brother. Uh, Glenn is Glenn and I talk every Thursday. He's my pastor back in Denver, and oh, he does awesome. a lot for. Uh, he goes. He has a ministry where he goes out for um, families that are being affected by by violence. So he goes out and he helps the the families that you know had the person that was hurt, and then they, he goes out and helps the families that you know might have had the person that did it also, and pours love into both of them. Pretty wow. awesome. And then we got claps coming in. Glad to be here. Good to see you, Crystal. Good to see you, Glenn. Obedience is like having a lightning lane pass. That's good. Amen. Amen. All right. So when we when we start talking about these divine opportunities, right, and what you just said about, you know, missing the opportunity, that that flyer that hit you in the leg, right, I that was exactly where I was going to go with it also. That was exactly the answer that I was thinking because that's what I've experienced over the last, like, six weeks. And then in the last week that we're going to get into that's happened, right? Yeah. So what what are some stories that you have started recognizing that can kind of show people that are listening how to actually recognize when these are happening? And maybe even if there's something they can do to start making them come into their lives. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think I can start with the, the two biggest reasons why we're missing them which is busyness and technology addictions. Mm. So when you're, when you're busy, you're going to miss divine opportunities all the time. Mm. And, and also just having a language for it. I mean, even just the fact that we're having this conversation and maybe somebody that's not familiar with the idea of, of what a divine appointment or a divine opportunity is, then they, now, they're, now they're aware of it. 
it's almost like, you know, when somebody goes and buys a new car and they think, oh man, I hardly ever see this car. This is such a unique color or whatever it is. Yeah. And they buy this car. And the second they drive off the lot, they start seeing it everywhere. Yes. And it's like, well, it's, those were cars and colors were always there. You just didn't have it in your, your mind and have that perceptive filter up. Amen. Now that you do, you're seeing it everywhere. And it's the same thing with divine opportunities because I've had, you know, when I talk about missed opportunities with people, you know, sometimes people are like, well, you know, I don't think I've really missed any opportunities. And, and I'm like, who are you? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, <Jr."? right. laughs> like, <laughs> like we've all missed opportunities probably right. today. And it, usually that kind of insinuates a little like uh, two different things. One that they, again, they're unfamiliar with this terrain of divine appointments and divine opportunities and to the point where, again, when you don't have a category for it and any way of expecting it, then you don't really recognize the fact that you're missing them. Right. And, uh, or you, you are kind of trying to catch them, but you're, you know, maybe underselling the small possibilities that are amidst you all the time. Mm -hmm. So the busyness is, is one thing that's huge is being able to just hit the pause button each day. You can, and I have a chapter in the divine opportunity book called living intentionally while uh, allowing for spontaneity. And it's this idea of we all have busy schedules and we have to-do lists that need to get done. We've got jobs. We've you know got kids, perhaps, and, and other things that are filling our schedules. And it doesn't mean you need to be a monk and, and try to retire and, and wander the earth. Is that you can still live intentionally, but allow for spontaneity. So in between appointments, hit the pause button. Reflect. Be open to prayer. Be open to God's prompting. When you're in line at Starbucks, when you're in line at you know, In-N-Out. Wherever you are, you can find yourself with a divine opportunity if you're willing to hit the pause button, relax, take a deep breath and see what God might want to do in there. And that's the same. The overlap then with the technology addictions is that all those moments in between our schedule where we could allow for spontaneity, we fill with our smartphone. And mm. so in that while we're in line at Starbucks, rather than having our head up and making eye contact and saying hello or whatever it might be is that we just bury our head in our phone for that time. If we've got a break at work, instead of you know, one, you know taking a walk uh, down the sidewalk and seeing what happens, or walking around the workplace and seeing what God might be up to, we sit in the break room and, and bury our head in our phone. So there's all sorts of things. And again, I'm, you know, I'm using it as an example. Obviously, lots of amazing things can happen through technology. I usually tend to say that technology is not inherently good and it's not inherently bad. Mm. It's how you, it's how you, you use it and yeah. we can use it. I think for three things, one for mindlessness, uh, two for maliciousness and mm. three for ministry. Mm. So you can do the mindless stuff where you're just scrolling and wasting time and not really getting anything done. You can use it maliciously for pornography or any, of you know, or badgering people and, you know, arguments online or whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> and, or you can choose to use it for ministry and say, Hey, you know, I'm going to take this out and I'm going to scroll through my Instagram. And the first person that pops up, I'm going to pray for, or I'm going to send a, a DM prayer to, or whatever it might be is yeah. so you can use it for all those different things, but that's, those are two factors, the business and, and the technology addictions that hinder people from being able to step in and living with purpose on, on a daily basis. So a story just came up um, that, I am going to tell that this happened uh, a couple years ago now, and my friends list had hit 5,000 on my Facebook, and so I and I had a bunch of requests, so I had to go through and start deleting the inactive accounts or whatever. Yeah. And as I'm going through there, I'm like 2,000 people deep, and then I see this girl's name that I haven't talked to in a few years, and I just heard that voice reach out to her. You know, I just mm -hmm. I just felt that voice reach out to her. And I reached out to her and I said, hey, how you doing? Uh, just just saw you and thought about thought about messaging you. And she was like, actually, not good. Um, my boyfriend is um, super heavy into drugs right now. And then we started getting in the conversation about that. And then uh, she was pregnant and had a a uh, appointment for the next day to mm -hmm. terminate it, mm -hmm. to terminate the pregnancy. And uh she had all these things going on with um, with the reasons why she was deciding to do that. And it all had to do with, you know, money. It was right before Christmas and she was worried about not being able to have a Christmas for her daughter. She already has. So me and another friend ended up like, you know, getting the Christmas wish list, going down there and just like loving on her and walking her through the process. Mm -hmm. And now she is completely happy 
to have this new son and this new little wow. brother for for her daughter, you know? And that's wow. something like we don't know what we're missing when when we feel that prompt and we decide not to do it. Yeah. And I'm I'm guilty of that daily. Mm. I am guilty of missing the prompt daily. But it's so rewarding to do, right? And what is you were talking about, you know, if they're standing in line at Starbucks, and obviously Starbucks is a very general uh, example. But if someone could consciously recognize uh, for the next week, even that they're in a public place and they're waiting and they get on their phone, what could be a trigger that would that they should do instead of that phone to look for one of these God opportunities in that moment? Yeah, great question. Yeah, a few practical things is one change, you know, the, the unlock screen, your home screen on your on your phone to something that will remind you to to stop and look around. I mean, you could literally put a thing that says stop and look around as your home screen. So when you go to get on your phone, you see it uh, and that prompts you that's to get so out good. of that. Yeah, uh, Maybe that's, you know, wipe clean a lot of those, you know, social media apps and things that you typically go to. Like my, all my social media apps are in a fold are in all in one folder and the folder is titled time waste. Mm. And so there's little things like that that you can kind of put as breaks and, and additional stopping points that will help to slow you down into that kind of a, addiction and fix. Because yeah. technology is doing the opposite. They want to remove as many steps as possible so that you can get to their app as quickly as possible. Right. And, that, and same thing with Amazon. You've got it all over the place. That's why they have one click purchasing is that they don't want you to stop and think about it. <laughs> they don't want you to right. click an extra button because they might lose the sale if you have to click one extra button. Exactly. So we have to actually do the reverse of adding a bunch of stopping points and kind of shape the path towards divine appointments. Yeah. So that's just kind of practically like on the phone. The other thing is, uh, actually, there's a great kind of little therapeutic example that's called uh, pause button therapy. Mm. And so it's super simple. They just use the example of like a remote control in your hand, you know, kind of thing or in your really in your mind where you just hit the pause button and it just pauses the situation just for a moment. And then you're able to really reflect on what you want to happen. Mm -hmm. So where have I gone wrong in the past? So the, they've got all the, re you know, the rewind function, the fast forward function, and then the play function. So it's this idea that you rewind to a time in the past where you stood in line and you did the mindless scrolling, just kind of mind numbing, nothing happened. And maybe you missed an opportunity. So you go back and relive. OK, I've been there. I've done that. I don't want that to be the case again now. Yeah. I remember the last time I missed an opportunity and how that felt, you know, walking away from that. So you actually kind of tap into that negative emotion as a negative emotion for motivation. And then you can fast forward. So what do I want the outcome to be in my experience here? And, and what would that look like? And then you can kind of do a little forward visionary uh, illustration. And then you just hit play. And I say, you know, I add pray into it, pray and then play. Yeah. But it's just simply really more than anything, just hitting pause and thinking, what would Jesus do? If Jesus were in the Starbucks, what would, what would he do? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's pretty convicting and pretty quick to assess. Right. right. Yeah, I and think, that's, um, those are some practical ones. Yeah. And I think when for for people in recovery, right, we get taught in the uh, in the 10th step to pause when agitated or doubtful. Mm -hmm. And that is specifically for recovery. Right. That's specifically for to make sure that we don't get caught up in emotions and thoughts and feelings and go too deep into resentments and things like that. Yeah. But this is on another level. This is like even when you're feeling great, even when you have everything that's going great in your recovery. To be able to go to another level, another level of joy, another level of, of God's will for your life, another level of that purpose that you've been looking for, pushing pause. And then you can even, what I love, love to do is look around for someone that makes eye contact. Yeah. Just really quick, just one quick scan. And then if no one makes eye contact, great. Okay. Then I'll, then I'll hop on the phone or whatever yep. I'm going to do. But if someone makes eye contact, just smile, you know, yep. smile, you know, wave and it's really interesting when you give a smile to somebody and you see how they react to it, mm -hmm. because if someone smiles back, you can tell if they're, you know, they're having a good day and stuff. And you can also tell when someone's hurting, you know, yeah. you can also just like really tell if someone just needs someone to talk to. Cause I've been, in, I've been there. I've been at places in my life when I just needed someone to come say hi. 
I remember one time, even in my recovery, I was like between one and two years and I was driving around in downtown Denver and I was having a hard time at the time. And I was purposely running red lights thinking, I just want a cop to pull me over because I just need someone to talk to, right? It would have been nice to have the practice of pushing pause right then and looking around mm -hmm. for someone to serve, right? But I know that people in recovery, even in recovery, we have these instances, right? So try pushing that pause button. Try looking around for someone just to say hi to, you know, and you might even have the opportunity to find someone that's in addiction, you know? Mm -hmm. So tell us one of those stories that that are from your dissertation or from your book that really show the power of this. Yeah. Well, and I love what you're just saying, too, is even just like looking around for somebody that's making eye contact. And I heard uh, another person put it this way of you're kind of looking for a person of peace, mm. somebody that's just that, that's open. And you can kind of tell those those people that might be open you know, by the, the quick assessment that you do and being able to, to see that and then step into it. And even just and start it. And, and a lot of this requires just curiosity right. of being being curious as to what might be going on. And the more that you do this, the more you realize how many people like yourself are out there that are just going through stuff. Yes. And I uh, just wrote you real quick, super practically, is that uh, I do an assignment in one of my classes that's called the, the low point pain funnel conversations. This low point conversations where the students are required to go and find three people that they know and simply just create an intimate space where they can open up and ask them, you know, would you be comfortable sharing a low point that you've been through in your life? Mm. And then just giving the person space to, to be able to share or not share. But it's been so fascinating over the last eight years of doing this assignment, student after student coming back saying like, wow, like, you know, I've known this person for four years and I had no idea that they were going through X, Y, or Z. Wow. I had a student one time. She said, I intentionally asked the three happiest people I knew and all three of them opened up and shared times where they were depressed, if not even having suicidal thoughts. Wow. And so I think everybody's got a burden to carry and a cross to cross to bear. Yeah. And, and so everybody's going through something and that's where we can really have, have those eyes to see and develop that curiosity and coming back to the, you know, they're, that whole WWJD thing has been around for, for decades yeah. because it's so simple and it's so quick and so effective. Mm -hmm. So let, let, yeah, a couple of examples of this. Well, since we're talking about Starbucks, I'll just give and, you some. And really quick, examples. really quick. Will you repeat? Because that was such a good question to start a deep conversation with someone. Will you repeat that question just so that the people out there can like remember it to simply start a conversation like this? Yeah, it's creating a space with somebody that you, you know, love, care about or getting to know and just really kindly and genuinely being open to saying, Hey, you know, what? I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I've been watching this podcast and, and they threw out this idea of these low point conversations. And it really got me thinking about how I don't really take the time to, to hear and, and create a space for these deep, meaningful conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, would you be open to having, having one of those? And cause, and then you can throw out the question that they posed was to ask people about a low point that they've been through in their life. And if they would feel comfortable uh, talking about that. I and then an additional follow-up to it is, is to ask them what was helpful and what was not helpful when you were in that low point. What were things that people said or did that really were helpful? And what were things that people said and did that weren't? Wow. And then it becomes a learning experience of recognizing, okay, like don't do that. Or, okay, wow, that's, you know, I wouldn't have thought that. And, and you'll hear a lot of people bring up prayer, you know, people that prayed for them, other things, but um, and then the third and final element of that conversation is to say, uh, how can I follow up with you about this? Mm. Or would you like me to follow up with you about this? And some people might be, nah, I'm good or whatever, but others might be like, actually, you know, I'm still kind of going through this. So yeah, if you could just check in maybe once a month, or maybe we could have a follow-up coffee conversation in a couple of weeks. Guys, if that, doesn't, if that doesn't translate into the recovery community, I don't know what does. There are a bunch of people that are in either early recovery or still in their addiction that would that mm -hmm. would do anything to have someone ask them that question with that kind of space. And guys, we're going to take a quick 30 second break. Got something for you here. We'll be right back to talk about the examples of this and how you can apply them to your life. What's up, family? I hope you're enjoying this episode as much as I do when I'm making them. And guys, if you are getting value from this, if you've heard any golden nuggets that you think other people should hear, make sure that you're sharing it with your groups or your pages so other people that are looking for a message of hope are able to find it.
Also, in case you weren't here for the beginning of the show, if you have a recovery story and you want to learn how to add impact and income through sharing it, follow the link in the pinned comment to book your one-time, 100% free call with me where we're going to strategize exactly how you can share your story and do just that. Enjoy the rest of the show. Keep living Recovered on Purpose. Awesome. And I am stoked to hear any of your stories. And this is a perfect conversation because guys, you, I know everybody that's been through addiction has had divine opportunities, has had, you know, divine interventions, as well as a lot of these low points, you know, and they're all things that we need to share to show the hope of recovery. So tell us about some of these, some of these stories that you, or I heard um, Deborah wants to hear the story about the woman who felt sh- she should offer to help the house with the toys out front, but then she decided not to. Let's hear yeah. That story. Yeah. So that uh, starts it off with even with a missed opportunity. And so this was uh, one of the women that I interviewed for the, for the dissertation research study. She shared a, a missed opportunity and this was one of those kind of heartbreaking missed opportunities, but it also drives home the point of, of one of the things that, that I kind of felt is those times where God prompts you to do something, step out, pray for somebody and you don't do it. You know, I always thought it was okay. Well, this is just between me and God. Like I wimped out, I blew it again. And, and now I feel bad, whatever it might be, but I was just viewed it. Well, well my disobedience is just between me and God. And God really highlighted like, no, your disobedience. It's not a neutral act. Other people's lives are negatively impacted with you withholding my glory, with withholding my grace for their lives. Mm. And this is one of those kind of heartbreaking stories where that becomes a reality. For this woman, she was driving home from work. She kind of had finished her, her typical work day around five, was kind of driving home. She was coming from an appointment, so she was taking a new way home. And she was driving through this neighborhood. And this is middle of the winter, really cold out. And she pulls up to this stop sign. And as she's sitting at this stop sign, she notices this house off to the side. And so she starts looking and there's nobody behind her. So she's just kind of sitting at this stop sign looking at this house. And it's looking really run down, really beat up. Uh, you know, the, it's winter, so everything's dead. But there are, some, there are some kind of kids' toys around the yard. So it looks like there's a family that lives there. But by the looks of it, other than that, you'd think that it was just kind of run down and abandoned. Yeah. And she said that while she was sitting at this stop sign, looking at this house, she felt the prompting that she needed to park her car, get out, go knock on the door and just simply ask them what she could do for them. Mm. Of course, she's thinking like we all would like that's incredibly awkward. Yeah. I don't know who's going to be on the si- other side of that door. What am I even going to say? Are they going to think that's totally weird? You know, she's running through all the things, yeah. which is really when we learn learn about it later. It's spiritual warfare. The enemy is yeah. trying to talk us down and talk us out of getting out of our comfort zone and, and being obedient to God. So she's running through all these negative scenarios and she just gets really, she just can't bring herself to do it. And so she just kind of drives off and doesn't really think much of it and just kind of continues on. Then she shared that two nights later, she's watching the evening news. And on the evening news is a story about a house fire in a local neighborhood. And as she's watching the story, she sees the image of the house and recognizes the house from two days earlier. And it's the house that she was sitting at, at that stop sign, looking at that God was prompting her towards. And as the story was being shared, the story unfolded that there was a family inside the house and they were doing, they had really fallen on hard times. So their gas had been shut off, so they couldn't run their heat. They could only run space heaters. They still had electric, so they could run space heaters. And they had a few kids. The youngest was an infant that was that they had sleeping in a car seat next to a space heater to stay warm. Only in the middle of the night, the baby had kicked its blanket off and onto the space heater. And it set the space heater in the whole house caught fire. And everyone got out of the house except for that infant who ended up dying in the house fire. Oh my and God. as she's watching this heartbreaking story unfold on the evening news, she realizes what God wanted her to do was to pay their gas bill and get their heat back on in their house. Oh my gosh. And she is just confronted with this kind of devastating missed opportunity, realizing like uh, it's not a neutral act. Like other people's lives are impacted by our disobedience. 
Mm-hmm. And what could have been the reverse of that had she actually stepped out in faith, trusted God, took the risk, stretched the comfort zone, and just it took 20 seconds of courage to walk up that sidewalk, knock on that door, and see what happened on the other side. Wow. So that's one of those kind of missed opportunities that really brings things into perspective. On a, on a hopeful side of that, I will say that from the people that I've interviewed and talked to, some of the folks that have the most amazing divine appointment stories are the same folks that have the most devastating missed opportunities Mm. because like that woman, they're like, okay, I, I have been confronted and slapped in the face with that missed opportunity. And it feels awful. Yeah. That kind of negative feeling. I don't want to feel that again. I would rather engage in awkwardness and social awkwardness than engage in devastating regret. And so now they're fired up and they're, they got eyes to see and they got motivation to give. Whereas honestly, it can work to your detriment to miss opportunities and never see the consequence of your, of your, mis, of your disobedience. Yeah. Because you never get that wake up call that, that a few others have, have received. So give us one of the, give us one of the hopeful ones. Cause my man, and the whole time you were telling me that I was feeling, feeling the spirit, like prompting me just saying yeah. this is what happens. This is what happens. This is the truth. Yeah. You know, and I believe, I believe in the power of God hundred mm-hmm. percent. Like he has, he's the King. He has dominion, but he, he gave us this world, right. To have dominion over and his miracles and his works and all of that has to be done through us here. And when we have these opportunities and we're called by God to do these things, if we feel that prompting, we have no idea the, the incredible things that could be on the other side, mm-hmm. you know, the, the lives that could be saved. I've never heard one quite like that. That's, that's incredible. Um, but let's, let's hear some hope. Let's hear the good yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even just from, um, my own personal stories, even just to, you know, go back to the Starbucks example, run, running with that. But I've had several divine appointments just even at, at, at Starbucks. And, and I'll give you a, a few just to kind of show you a range of things. So one, a, f- a few years back was seeing this woman. She was sitting there uh, with like a, a Kindle kind of doing some reading and just felt prompted to go over and say hello, introduce myself, give her a book and, and offer to pray for her. And so I go over kind of introduce myself, say hello. We kind of start talking and, and ask if I can sit down for a second. And she was okay with that and give her the book. And, uh, and then I just offered it. Hey, can I, can I pray for you? And she was like, no, you know, like I'm, I'm good. And, and, and I was like, oh, okay. And, and I was honestly like, wow, like life must be awesome. And, and she's like, well, no, I mean, there's, there's stuff. And she's like, well, I guess, you know, like my, you can pray for my sister-in-law, you know, she just, got done with her, her cancer surgery and she's in recovery right now. I was like, absolutely. You know, would it be okay if I just prayed for her right now with you real quick? And I think her name was Gwen. And uh, she said, sure. So I prayed, prayed for with Gwen. And when I finished this prayer, she just goes, wow. She's like, that's crazy. She's like, as you were praying, I remembered that a few years ago, a handful of years ago, I had my own cancer treatment and cancer surgery And shortly after I got out of my cancer surgery, somebody stopped me and prayed for me exactly the way that you just prayed for her. She's like, wow, like that is crazy. (laughs) And she was just blown away. Uh, Another one was a guy that he homeless guy. He was kind of hobbling in with some crutches, ordered a drink, I think got a water, maybe a a snack or something and was kind of hobbling out. And I felt prompted to go pray for his healing Mm. uh, because he had this knee issue. You could tell. And I was kind of hesitant, you know, what, what we all deal with, like, what if nothing happens kind of a thing? Yeah. And, and I just felt God prompt me saying, if you knew that I would heal him, would you go pray for him? Mm. I was like, well, I, yeah, <laughs> if I knew for sure. <laughs> Amen. And he's like, well, then go pray for him. And so I go out and I was like, hey, man, he was actually about to get on a bicycle. I was like, hey, man, you know, I just happened to see you in there and just kind of came out to say hello and was just kind of curious what was going on with your knee and if everything's OK. He's like, well, man, I, you know, I busted this knee in a motorcycle accident decades ago and it's just never been the same right now. It's like it's just, there's no cartilage. It's just bone on bone and super painful. Mm. I was like, well, what's the pain level on like a scale of one to ten? He's like, oh, man, probably like an eight. And I was like, well, would it be OK if I prayed for your knee? And he's like, sure, you know, that's fine. 
And so I got his name and uh, Kevin and was praying for him. And so I put my hand, it's okay if I put my hand on your knee. So I put my hand on his knee, said, you know, Jesus name, knee be healed, did the whole thing, prayed for him. And I was like, okay, well check it out. And so he starts moving his knee and kind of taking a few steps around. And he's like, oh man, that's bizarre. He's like, I was like, what, what what's going on? He's like, man, that's, that's weird. Like, what's going on? He's like, well, the pain's gone. And I was like, man, it's Jesus healing you, dude. He goes, yeah. he looks at me and he goes, are, are you a healer? <laughs> I was like, I was like, I'm a Christian, man. Amen. And he's like, you know, well, I'm open. Well, I'm just kind of spiritual. And I haven't really landed, the, landed the plane on anything in particular. And I was like, well, man, I, I think you need to give Jesus a shot after that. <laughs> yeah. I was like, and the Bible says, you know, those, the, the unbelievers, they're, they're like the, 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 you know, being blown around on the, on the waves of the ocean, mm-hmm. tossed to and fro when you're unsettled, like, and it produces this unsettled feeling. Do you feel yeah. that? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, well, I think that's God, you know, letting you know to, to turn to him. Mm-hmm. He's like, well, you know, I'll see how long this healing lasts. And I was like, well, if it, if it doesn't just pray like I did in Jesus name. He's like, all right, thanks, man. We just had this little interaction. You know, again, he didn't accept Christ or any of that kind of thing, but had this crazy little encounter right there at Starbucks, just seeing him and being open. And then the last one I'll share uh, is, and there's so many, but uh, just the most recent kind of fresh one was I was there. This is a few months back. I was there on a Friday evening working on a message for a men's conference I was speaking at. And I see this kind of young, uh, 20, he was like 25 year old African-American guy in the, in the corner, had his phone, phone plugged in. He was just there for hours on his phone and I'd seen him there before. And so I felt prompted to go over and just kind of chat with him and pray for him on the way out. So I went over, introduced myself, said, hello. Turns out he, he was homeless, you know, young guy, 25. And he just kind of comes to Starbucks, plugs in his phone. And he's there all day mm-hmm. every, uh, and just day after day. And so I was like, hey, can I pray for you? And he was like, yeah, he's totally open. So I prayed for him. And I felt prompted. We had a men's breakfast the next, the very next morning at our church. And so I invited him. And I was like, dude, you should come check it out. He's like, awesome. He's like, absolutely. I gave him the address. He's like, he's like, I'll be there. So Saturday morning, I show up waiting around for him. Totally doesn't show up. <laughs> just, just skips out. So I go back Saturday evening to keep working on this message. And there he is again in his corner. And, I, and I'm like, and so I end up finishing up and I go back over to him. I'm like, Antoine, like, man, like, where were you, bro? And he's like, ah, oh, no, I just got distracted. I just stayed up too late, whatever. And we went outside. We were talking to his other buddy who was also homeless and ended up praying for both of them. And both of them were kind of touched. And so I told him, hey, tomorrow's church service. We got a church at, service at, at noon. We actually got water baptisms if you guys want to get water baptized. And actually, they were both totally open to it. So I left that night shaking their hands, looked them in the eyes and said, OK, I'm going to see you there tomorrow at 1130. Gave him a church card, the whole thing. They're like, yeah. So I show up, I pack it, you know, here I am just kind of naive and hopeful, but <laughs> Sunday morning I packed a bag with, with some swim trunks and a towel. I'm ready to like baptize these dudes. And I get there, they don't show up and stiffs me again. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to go to Starbucks because I know where he's at. So, <laughs> and that was his, that was his problem is he kept showing up to the same spot. I'm like, dude, at least find a place where I can't find you. So I go over to Starbucks and sure enough, he's dead asleep in the corner. And I go over, I'm like, Antoine, man, what's up? And he's like, oh, man, I'm sorry. Kind of gets into it. We end up just kind of bringing church to him right there and had an awesome conversation again. I'm like, okay, well, this Tuesday, I got an amazing buddy of mine. He's coming as a guest speaker. He's got this crazy prophetic gifting. He's got a story very similar to what I think you'll resonate with. Come. He's like, all right, I'll be there. Tuesday comes, no show. (laughs) Again, I'm like, dude. So I take my guest speaker and we actually stop by Starbucks on the way out of town. And sure enough, he's there. And so my buddy talks to him, gives him a word. I end up sticking around, talking to him for a while and just kept pressing in on this guy. And, um, you know, I ended up finding, he's like, I do want to go to church. I know I need that. And I was like, okay, well, you just get to Starbucks at 1130. I'll pick you up and I'll bring you to church. So I do that the next Sunday, take him to church. He finally comes into church. And from the moment the worship started to the end, the last song, he was just crying like mm. the whole time, just getting touched, got prayed for by our pastor. And, and he keep, and I keep picking him up for church. He ends up getting a, getting to stay in a place with, with one of his buddies that's further away, like 20, 25 minutes away. And I'm driving, picking him up, bringing him. Now, eventually he texts me one time and he's like, dude, he's like, I think I'm going to do the Jesus fast. 
I'm like, what do you, what do you mean by Jesus fast exactly? He's 40 like, no, days. 40, yeah. He was like, 40 days, you know, only water. I'm like, bro, I love your enthusiasm, but let's, like, Jesus did a few things before that. How about, yeah. water, like, getting water baptized? He's like, all right, let's do it. So he ends up getting water baptized. And that when he gets water baptized, my buddy comes over and uh, he, he tells me, he's like, dude, when Antoine got baptized, I just had this vision of these demons and their faces had utter shock on their faces. And while the demons and the, the, uh, the kingdom of darkness was in shock, heaven was rejoicing. Mm, amen. It was this powerful, powerful moment. Fast oh. forward. Uh, he wants to get a job as a, as a security guard, but he needs to take this online course to get his guard card. So my wife and I pay for him to get his guard card, the course. We're not really sure if he's actually going to do it, but sure enough, he does. He pumps it out in like two days, takes the takes the course, gets the card, and unbeknownst to me, starts applying for jobs. We went on vacation a couple weeks to come back. I happened to go to Starbucks. He actually was living further away now at this point, so I wasn't seeing him there. But as I'm sitting there working at Starbucks, I see him walk in and he's dressed up a little bit nicer than normal. And I'm like, dude, Antoine, like, what are you doing, man? He's like, oh, he's like, man, I'm, I'm here for a job interview. I'm like, no way. And he's like, yeah. And also he had a twin brother that he hadn't really talked to in like three years, I think. And during that time, he had reconnected with his with his twin brother. He actually moved in with him, his girlfriend and her family, had a new place to stay that was much better. And I actually, God just totally blessed me because it was so amazing. But as I'm sitting in Starbucks working, I look across the Starbucks towards the same corner where I saw him just three months earlier, homeless, isolated and alone on his phone. He's now sitting there uh, having a job interview. And I got to take a picture of him at the job interview, signing the documents to accept the position. And now he's, he's working five days a week, uh, making like 4,000 a month. And it's just been one of those that where it's all, it, it, it all started with, you know, I talk about in the divine opportunity book, is that there's a statement of just walk across the room. So many, that whole long story started with a simple walk across the room. There's a great line from the movie, So We, uh, so we Bought a Zoo. And he's talking to his son and he says, all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage. He's like, I promise you, take 20 seconds of embarrassing courage and something great will happen. And it's the same way with the divine appointments. Just walk across the room, 20 seconds of courage and have some curiosity as to what God might be up to. And, and you just never, never know. And that's Bro. one of those recent ones that was just mind blowing. So amazing. You, you just told my story. Really? I was, I was him. Wow. Um, and, and you were Brendan to him. Wow. When I was, when I was homeless and kicked out of the homeless shelter, um, I had one person that would always pick me up from the homeless shelter, from the streets, from wherever I was, if I was high or not, and would take me to breakfast or would take me to church or would take me to Bible study. Mm -hmm. And one thing he never said was that you need to stop using drugs. Mm -hmm. He never said that to me once. He's my best friend to this day. Mm -hmm. What he did was he pressed in and showed love mm -hmm. to, to somebody that was, that was lost, to somebody that felt unlovable, right? And he actually baptized me in the, wow. in the Yellowstone River. Um, <laughs> and man, that's just, it's just amazing, guys. When, there's, when you have an opportunity to do something like that with someone, right? When you have the opportunity to, to introduce someone to a life-changing event, whether it be, you know, helping them find a job or helping them find, you know, recovery or whatever it is, or if it's as big as, you know, introducing them to God, don't miss those opportunities. Mm -hmm. It is the most fulfilling thing you can possibly feel when someone's life and their soul is saved because you were obedient. Mm -hmm. And one thing I wanted to bring up, when you, when you were talking about the, the guy that you're praying for for his knee, right? And, you know, he didn't give his life to Jesus then and like that kind of stuff. And then he walked away. I'm guessing you haven't seen him, right? No. So I've had this happen, things like this happen all the time. And I want to ask you, what is, what is your thought about what you did then and where he might be now or where yeah. he is now? Yeah. I mean, the go-to verse for me is some plant, some water, but yes. God brings the increase. Is yes. that, uh, 
the final chapter of the divine opportunity book talks, I, I'd use that scripture and I break it down in terms of, I use the analogy of pitchers on a baseball team mm. is that there are starters, relievers and closers. Mm. And, and so that's the idea of the planting, the watering and, and God bringing the increase is yes. that we can be used in all three of those ways. And so that's, and, and again, this is what I really want to emphasize too, is because you're not always going to get the amazing ending of the story. You're not yeah. always going to hear that. And you can become discouraged by stepping out and not seeing things happen, but you have to have faith and know that, that the word of God never returns void, yeah. that you're called to plant seeds. You know, there's the scripture that says those that, those that sow generously reap generously, mm. those that sow sparingly reap sparingly. Mm. So the more seed you're throwing out there is, is the more things are going to grow and turn up in, in your, in your life and other, other people's lives. But yes. also don't get your eyes on stuck on, on results is that there was this statement that came up a, a few years ago that, we, that was just simply loving regardless of the results. Mm. So loving people, stepping out in compassion, regardless of the results. Yes. Even if even times, and I've had plenty of times where honestly, I felt like nothing happened. And I just had that a few months ago, I was at Applebee's. A guy comes up to me while I'm sitting there eating with a buddy and a waiter there. And he's like, hey, man, he's like, I don't know if you remember me, but but you prayed for me like three years ago. And I had just prayed for him and I think given him a book. And he's like, I still got that book on my on my shelf. And I just wanted to say thank you. Mm. Like, had I not heard that three years later, I would have thought that that prayer and that that time with him really amounted to, to nothing. <laughs> yes. And yeah. so you have to just be faithful and know that there will certainly be times where you're planting seeds, you're doing some watering and you're not seeing the increase. But we're, that's why we're part of a team. Yeah. <laughs> and like teamwork makes the dream work. Amen. And so when you're stepping out, who knows who else is going to pick up that 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 story with that person? Who Amen. knows is going to come along and water what you planted? And, and another person comes along and waters, but ultimately we got to do that. And real one, real quick example, and I'll turn it back over to you is I once heard this, uh, this pastor, Francis Chan, and Love he Francis was Chan. <laughs> yeah, incredible, amazing, amazing man of God. I've been, been blessed to kind of know his family and, and get a little sneak peek into his, into his life. And he's the real deal, <laughs> like whether you, wherever you see him, but anyway, he was staring, telling the story about how he's at a coffee shop, saw this guy, felt prompted to step out and talk to the guy, introduce himself. And for whatever reason, he doesn't. And so he kind of starts heading off to church and he gets halfway there and feels really convicted. So he drives back and goes up to the guy he's still there and says, hey, man, uh, you know, I just felt like God was prompting me to come over and say and, and, and to introduce myself and say hello. And so he does. And he's like, you know, nothing really happens. There was nothing that emerged, nothing that came to surface, just kind of a quick little odd interaction. And then he turned and, and left. <clears throat> but he was faithful. Yeah. Now imagine this, that same guy goes out to lunch later that day. God puts the impression and prompting on somebody else to step out. And somebody else at, at lunchtime comes over and is like, hey, man, this might sound kind of odd, but I felt like God wanted me to come over and, and say hi Ooh. to you and introduce myself. <laughs> now this guy might be like, wow, like what, what's going on? Yes. And then imagine that doesn't really go you know, crazy anywhere. But maybe the guy's out that late later that night or evening and he's picking up groceries and somebody goes up to him in the grocery store. Hey, man, I don't know. This might sound kind of random, but I felt like God wanted me to come over and introduce you myself. And now this guy is like, because everybody was obedient, this guy is. is and that's what has the opportunity with planting, watering and, and increase is that we just don't know where we're playing, where we're being used at in that person's experience. Yeah. And our obedience might be the difference between a total wake up call for that person or. One person was obedient, but not all three. And it loses its influence and opportunity in that yes. way. Amen. And guys, this, this correlates with the recovery community perfectly. Like when we are sharing our stories and we're talking to the people that are suffering, we're talking to even addicts that are in recovery and we're, we're sharing a message. We're sharing things that we're doing outside. We're sharing, you know, things that we're passionate about in our recovery and they hear it from this person and then this person and then this person and then this person, they start to build up that hope for their own life. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have no idea what that's going to prompt them to do, because in my experience, you know, what I'm what I'm called to do, what my purpose is, is not necessarily, you know, everybody that hears me speak. It's not necessarily their purpose, but I've actually witnessed this with people that have nothing to do with recovery. 
that hear me talk about my purpose, that hear me talk about what I'm doing and, and, you know, these kinds of things, hear me on this podcast or other podcasts, and it gets them to want to do that thing that they've always wanted to do, right? And sometimes, guys, that's what we're supposed to do in recovery. Just by sharing our recovery loudly, we're going to be inspiring others to do the same. And another thing I want to touch on um, that I heard Francis, just because you brought Francis Chan up, and I thought you were going to go into this story, but he had this other um, this other story about he got prompted to talk to somebody and then um, didn't didn't go right. But then uh, or no, it did go right. And you made a made an appointment to meet with the dude. And mm-hmm. then he couldn't make that appointment and he had to send someone else to go get him and bring him back or something. And because he was like, nah, this guy needs Francis Chan. God called Francis Chan to help this guy. And then the guy that he sent to talk to him ended up having the divine appointment be beyond what Francis wow. Chan could have even been able to do. So the power is not in ourselves. The power is in being obedient because him making that appointment was to set up this other person to go there randomly, right? And we have to trust. We have to trust. And that's what I was getting to with that, with the guy that, uh, with his knee. And that's exactly what I've, I've gotten to a point. I don't even remember when it was. It was like, it was way back. Like even when I was in my addiction, when I would, when I would just know that this little thing that I did for somebody could possibly very well have changed their life. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to see anything, you know, but that little moment of love that I gave that person out there when I, when I was homeless, you know, that little piece of love could have set them up just to know that they, that somebody loves them, you know, Mm -hmm. these little things that we do and I never have to see them again, you know, or praying for someone. And I don't even have to know about the results because I trust God. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get to see some cool stuff. Okay. So we're going to get into uh, really quick. We had a conversation. What was it about a week ago? Yeah. To to set up for the show. Mm -hmm. And you said something that prompted me. Because I, I love praying for people. I love talking to people. I love seeing what's going on with their life and then praying for them. And because I've been caught up in busyness, right, I, I haven't been practicing that habit. Mm. But over the last week, I have. And I've gotten the opportunity to do it for like three different people. And I'm building something down here. And since we're at the end of the show and there's there's a certain amount of people watching right now, I am working on building a treatment center down here. And it's not going to be caught up with the all of the stuff that's going on in the United States and all of the, uh, you know, it's not going to have to be charged that much and be, you know, insurance and all that stuff. And God's been prompting me to do it for like six weeks. But after our call, I made the decision, I'm going to start making connections. I'm going to start looking into this. I'm going to start doing this. And one of the first people that I reached out to to talk about how we do this. You know, I talked to an attorney, someone that I'm partnering with, and then I made an MD friend. But then the first person I talked to that had a facility that was doing this practice, doing this treatment, when I talked to him at the end of the call, I was like, do you mind if I pray? Do you mind if I pray for us, for you? And so I I reached out and I (laughs) prayed and prayed for his, for his treatment, prayed for whatever God to, you know, help us with this connection and to do his will. And when I open my eyes back up after saying amen, he is bawling. Wow. Just bawling. He's like, dude, me and my family have been praying for you for this to come into our life. And he's just bawling because they have this, this whole wow. incredible system, but they don't know how to take it to this other place that need that it needs to go. I'm not going to get into all the details right now, but yeah. it's coming. It's coming. And I and I and after having that conversation, like you were saying before, when you when you're in this conversation, when you're open to having the conversation about, you know, how God is showing up in your life. If you if you surround yourself with friends that talk about how God is showing up in their life, you will start to be in that conversation. You will start to Mm -hmm. recognize it in your own life. You'll start to be looking for how God is in your life. And then God shows up in that. So yeah. make sure, guys, that you are you are connecting with the right people in your recovery, the right people in your life. If you're watching this, and you're not in recovery. There are there are so many people out there that need you. You that are watching this, 
And God has something for you. God has something for uh, you to share with the world, whether it be a story that you went through, whether it be a talent that you have, whether it be, you know, some kind of purpose inside of you that someone out there is counting on right now in this moment. And you have a new level coming after listening to this. Mm -hmm. Ryan, I appreciate you being here so much, brother. Do you want to uh, you want to pray, pray us out and pray for everybody that's listening? Absolutely. Well, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for every single person that's watching this live, uh, watching and listening to the recording, that uh, that this has sparked something inside of them, mm. a hunger and a desire for more of these experiences and more of these encounters, that they just really want to be used by you. They want to surrender their life to you, surrender these moments to you each and every day. And so, Lord, I pray that you fill them with a, a boldness and a courage and with your Holy Spirit to prompt them and to step out of the comfort zone, break down the walls of discomfort and step out a little bit further and just inch their way back out and that you will show up and show off in their lives. Lord, that you would prompt them to just step out and start praying for people. It's the simplest, mm-hmm. easiest way to begin with, with simply just offering prayer and letting the Holy Spirit speak through them as they pray. Mm-hmm. That you would give them words of knowledge or prophecy, that you would give them hands of healing. Yes. And ultimately, that you would give them a heart of great compassion and love mm. to be able to see the unseen and hear the unheard, but have a heart that drives connection. Lord, that you would just give them an opportunity to be able to share the love of Christ, that we are here mm-hmm. to represent you, that we are the body of Christ, that we are your hands and feet here to bring heaven, the kingdom of heaven down to here on yes. earth, yes. that your glory would shine in them and through them, that they would have a peace about this, that they would have uh, the ability to extend themselves grace mm-hmm. when they recognize an opportunity and they miss it and they let it pass, that they would extend themselves grace and know that they're on a journey and that you're going to keep sending opportunities after opportunities and that they can see these things through. So Lord, we pray for them in the power of the Holy spirit and in Jesus mighty name. Amen. 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 And there is one thing that we're going to close with um, that I saw. What would you say if someone was watching a show about God opportunities Mm -hmm. and happened to comment this? I've been looking at that. Oh, come on now, Crystal. Shoot. (laughs) You better get Chris baptized. <laughs> yeah, amen. You're here for a reason. Amen. Hey, if you haven't caught yet, I believe in divine appointments. And amen. I believe that this is a divine appointment for Crystal. Is amen. that quite honestly, you know, my father-in-law, when he would go out and preach, his his my mother-in-law, his wife would put a little note in his Bible. And it said, today, someone's life is going to be changed. Mm. And, and it's this idea of that it's not about the thousands. If that happens, awesome but it's simply about the one. And so I really believe crystal you're the one that God, God made this happen for. And so step into it. If you need a follow up on, on that, reach out, let either of us know Uh, if you need to be connected to a local area uh, or church or whatever that might be, but let's do this. You got a fresh start baptism. Come on, dying to the old brand new, new creation in Christ coming out. That's the reality of the gospel. I just read it in it's in Ephesians and Colossians, but this idea that you through Christ and being cleansed in that water baptism, you're, you're made clean and presented back to the Lord faultless. Amen. And without wrinkle or blemish. And that is on the horizon. Come on now, Crystal. Amen. (laughs) Amen. All right. And I did make a promise at the beginning of the show. um, So I am going to tell you a story. And they took, this is one of the stories that they actually, because everybody's heard this, they took stories out of the Bible, right? And I don't know why, but this one was taken out. So Hmm. um, Jesus is, is getting ready with the 12 disciples and they're about to go out on the, on the great commission, you know, and they, they don't really know, you know, what they're about to do, but Jesus has to let them all know how important this is, you know? And so for the first time he tells them all, I'm the son of God. And Peter's looking at him. He's like, no way. Jesus goes, Yahweh. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I thought you were being serious at first. (laughs) We had to to bring a joke in for James. Oh, my gosh. We had to bring a joke in. (laughs) 
<laughs> you did it. That was perfect. Amen. Oh Amen. my gosh. Guys, thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed this. If you got some some word from this, if you got some blessing from this, make sure you share it with someone that, that you want to hear the message. Guys, we love you so much. Keep living. Recovered on purpose.